so let's uh, look at how did um, Young's experiment proved that light was not a stream of particles. So if you do what he did, so you have a, a source of light and let me remind you, this is the 1800, there is no electricity, there is no light bulbs. He didn't have, evidently he didn't have a laser. So this was a very hard experiment to do. But he did it, and so you send light this way, then the light goes through a screen. This is what the screen looks in the front, and this, this kind of diagrams uh, confuse people. This is the screen in the front, it has cut out two slits, right? So this is the side view of that screen. The screen is this way, and it has slits here and here, and the light is coming from this way. So the light, <clears throat> if it was a stream of particles, then the places where it finds the slit, then those photons would be able to go through. And they will hit the screen, and you will see bright, if you were looking at this screen, this is again the side view, so the front view of the screen will be, let's say that the light is green. So you would see this line and this line corresponding to each one of the slits, right? <clears throat> the screen is just blocking some and letting pass some other ones. That's what you would expect if it was, if it was made of particles. But that's not what he saw. What he saw, which you can see over there also, you already looked at it, is a pattern more like this. The pattern that you saw before would correspond to these little lines of light, this black one and the other one corresponding to the places where the slit just lets the light go through. But what you actually see is something very, very different. It's a number of lines. It can be a, a, a good number of lines. And they're wide. And there is places in between them that have no light at all. <coughs> so that completely looks like an interference pattern, just like we discussed before when we had two sources of sound producing waves at two different locations. Those waves, to arrive at a particular point on the screen, they travel a different distance. And because of that, they arrive at that point with a different phase. And if two waves have different phase and they're overlapping, they're trying to be at the same place at the same time, they will interfere with each other. <clears throat> and then you can have points where they cancel out each other completely. You can have points where they over, uh, interfere constructively with each other and so on. You will have this kind of pattern if light was a wave. <clears throat> So, <coughs> to understand uh, precisely how this pattern is produced, you can use Huygens' principle. Huygens was a contemporary of Newton, and he was his main rival with this thing about the theory of light, whether light was a, a wave or a particle. And he came up with a very clever way of calculating, without a computer, now these days we just put the equations for a wave and the computer solved the equations for you. At that time you didn't have that. He came up with a very clever way of computing how a wave propagates. So what he did was this. Suppose that I create a, a, a wave here, a wave front, this line, a uh, wave front refers to the uh, crest of a wave, right? Suppose that you created a wave, say that maybe it's coming from the left, far away from the left. When it arrives at this point, the particles in that medium are going to be shaken by the wave, right, by the wave front. And the way the wave is going to behave after that is that each point on the wave front, each point of the medium at the location of the wave front, uh, behaves as if it was a source by itself. Because each part, uh, particle, this makes complete sense, right? When the wave comes in, if you're the particle, you start shaking, right? But you know that any point in a, in a wave, in a medium that shakes, will produce waves. If it was the only point there, it would definitely produce waves, just like when you put a finger, you touch the surface of the water. So you can imagine that each point on this wave front produces waves, so these are the circular. After some time, those waves produced at each point will propagate in circles. And the funny thing about that is that the, those uh, wave fronts of the, the wave fronts of the wavelets, these little waves produced by every point are called wavelets, they overlap along this straight line. So when the wave front arrives here, if you know that that's the way what the wave is doing at that time, this kind of uh, procedure allows you to uh, see what's going to be the shape of the wave front sometime later. It's going to be like this. You, con you uh, draw a line connecting the wave fronts. 
the places it shows the line along which they overlap. <coughs> if suppose that at some point you knew that the wave, one of the wave fronts was like this, and it's expanding out, and you wanted to calculate what does that wave front look sometime later, then you imagine that each point of this is a source. It produces a spherical wave, a circular wave around it. So this one is the wave produced at this point. This point produces a spherical wave. This point produces a spherical wave, and so on. And again, if you draw a line along the uh, tangent to all of these wave fronts, then this tells you what this wave front is going to be doing, the shape of it, sometime later. <clears throat> so this procedure tells you you can start, you don't have to start with a circle, you can have some shape. Suppose that you have some object with some uh, weird shape and you don't put it in the water, on the surface of the water, several times and you make waves. So you're not going to have circular waves propagating away, they're going to have some shape. If you would like to, at that time, if you wanted to know exactly how those waves propagated, this is what you would do. <clears throat> but it's, um, we're, we're talking about it, not because we don't have computers, but because it gives you a very clear picture of what's going on with waves, how they propagate. <clears throat> so this, uh, this uh, the, what Young saw in his experiment, these bands, the wide bands, and some bright regions, and dark regions, and so on, we can understand it using Huygens' principle. Let's look at the propagation of the light as it goes through one slit, just one slit. Right? So you have these wave fronts arriving. When the wave front arrives at this point, it's been blocked by this, the screen, right? So only this part of the wave front arrives here. Uh, draw some points. Think of the points on the medium, these four points only. <clears throat> and how they are going to respond to that. So each one, Huygens principle says that each point is going to become a source of waves. So after a period t, those wave, waves would have moved the distance lambda equal to this lambda, right? So there is a circle center around this point, there's a circle center around the second point, a circle center around the third one, and the fourth one, right? Those circles have a, this sort of overlap in this region. They don't overlap all over this region, they only overlap strongly on this region. If you uh, let this continue for some, for, for some other period, then those circles are bigger, right? This wave, the wave produced by this point has expanded all the way to here, and now they're overlapping along this line. We let a period T go by, they're over here. And as time goes on, those waves produced by these four guys, they are propagating out that way, and they are confined to this region, like a cone. In three dimensions, that would be a cone. If this was a circle, for example, then it would be a cone centered at the, the hole that you have in your screen. So they propagate out that way. <coughs> These are the waves that you would measure, uh, that you would see if you were doing this kind of experiment. You wouldn't see this ones because uh, the fact that you only have four here is an artifact. I, I just divided this into four points, but I could have done 10 million points, and then this would be so close together that you couldn't tell one from the other. The only ones that you would definitely uh, see something would be w the points where all of those tiny little waves overlap. And that would be very clearly a line like this one, and a line like this one, and a line like that one. If you have a, <coughs> a cell phone that uh, you can do Google Maps, try typing Humboldt Hill Humboldt, California. If you go to satellite view, this is what you're going to see. This is Humboldt Bay. I don't know where Humboldt, if there's a city of Humboldt nearby here, but just type that and it will take you there. And what you see here is that the ocean waves are, are going through this narrow channel, right? So just like in the screen, in the screen, previous screen that I show you, here it probably is too shallow for the waves to propagate. In any case, you don't see the waves there. But definitely here, probably this is the deepest part of the channel. The waves are propagating there, and you see you could even measure the wavelength, right? And then as they enter this region, the constriction is gone. They enter a region that has a, a, a wide region, so they expand along this line and along this line. And you see the cir circular wave fronts uh, propagating towards the beach. The 
that, what we just described, is called diffraction. And we'll go again, we'll talk about that and, and find out an equation that describes diffraction. In particular, it describes an equation that describes the angle at which the light is going to come out. Right? This cone that I was talking about, and that you can see here, how wide is that cone? That is the equation that is going to be interesting for us when talking about diffraction. But for now, I just want to <coughs> talk about the basic principle using uh, Huygens principle to uh, to understand wave propagation. So that's what happens due to one of the slits, one of the two slits that uh, we had. So to see what happens when the two lids, uh, slits are there, is the same uh, that we saw before. Each slit is going to produce this kind of pattern, and the waves spread over this cone, and the waves produced by the other slit spread over this cone, and those cones overlap. There's going to be a region of space, and the further you are, the bigger the region where they're going to overlap. So the places where they overlap, we're back to the discussion of two sources emitting, producing uh, uh, waves, and looking at the interference of those waves at different points in space due to the different path lengths that those waves have taken to go there. So we're back to that picture that, that we already saw, which is... <laughs> the two slits, now you can consider them to be uh, sources. One slit is here, the other one is here. It's going to be this kind of source. Of course, you don't have this, this part of this diagram doesn't apply to the two slits because what's coming from the left is a plane wave coming this way. But you, the forward part of it uh, is going to be pretty much the same except for the fact that the waves coming out of this uh, slit are not going to be uniform in space like that. They're going to be focused on a cone, right? The same for this one. Those waves, all this part and this part is going to be gone, and the waves are only going to have significant amplitude in a cone. But when those cones overlap, say in this region, suppose that those cones are overlapping because that angle is like this and that like that, and the other one's big like that too, then in the places in space where those cones overlap, then you have the usual picture of waves coming from two different sources and traveling different distances and having different phases. So you're back to this discussion. And the equations that we wrote for uh, that case would apply for light. Exactly the same equation. Okay? So in the lambda that you see there will be the wavelength of the light that you're using to shine on the two slits. The D would be the distance between the two slits. <coughs> That's the equation that we obtain. And for light, this is a very common situation you would have where the wavelength of light would be much smaller than the distance between the two slits. So if that is true, then you see that the ratio between lambda and d is a very small number. And if your m is not millions and millions, then m times lambda divided by d would still be a small number. And therefore, the angle is a small angle. And for small, small angles, the sine of the angle is equal, very close to being the angle. This is only in radians, right? So uh, you can go for, for optics, for light. You can go from this equation if you have a two-slit situation, to this equation, which is a little simpler, right? And, um, and this equation tells you that the, that the bright lines are going to be separated by the same distances, uniformly separated by the same distance on the screen. Because if those angles are the same, the angle for the first uh, bright spot is a sum, and then for the second one is the same angle, and for the third one is the same angle, then those distances on a screen uh, are going to be approximately the same. So if you call the location on the screen variable y, then that location, as I said, is just uniformly spread. Those points on the screen, or what you saw over there, are separated by the same distance. At least the ones that are close to the um, horizontal, which, the, which is the point that satisfy this. <coughs> So what you see here is a regular pattern. What this equation describes is a regular pattern of bright and dark spots on the screen. L in that equation is the distance between the two the slits and the screen. Okay.
So that's what I just said before. The bright spots separated by dark spots and the distance between a bright line and the next one in this approximation that we're using. In this approximation, that distance is just lambda divided by d times l. I'm missing an l here. Lambda divided by d times l. That would be the, that distance. And it should be the same. 